Hi everyone, thank you for joining today. Um, really excited about uh, game day at Unitize 2020. Um, have a, a great um, group of people that came together to figure out how um, blockchain can transform the gaming industry and create systems that provide um, more equity for more people around the world uh, across the two and a half billion people that play games um, every day today. Uh, and create more economic opportunity and, and systems that um, pull more people in and, and hopefully um, align um, developers and, and players more and more, uh, as you just saw in the video on community economics uh, that we walked through. Uh, we have a great um, group of speakers today, including um, folks from Dapper Labs, who are the creators of a, the Flow blockchain, which is designed specifically for, for games and applications like games, as well as the creators of CryptoKitties. We have folks from um, Engine, who are the creators of the ERC-1155 standard on the Ethereum blockchain, and they have a rich platform and, and set of tools for game development. Um, we have Immutable Labs, who are the creators of one of the leading blockchain games today in Gods Unchained, and they also have a gaming platform. Uh, we have other speakers like um, the folks from Starkware, who are some of the leaders in the world um, in figuring out um, scalability for mass market applications on blockchain like, like games. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to introduce uh, Kathy Barrera, who uh, is a founding partner at PRISM Group. Um, Kathy and PRISM have done phenomenal work in economics, um, and today we'll have a conversation about what game economies really could look like um, in the future as they start to em embrace blockchain and introduce more economic ownership for players and um, more market uh, systems and, and economies in, inside of games. So Kathy, thank you for joining today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> really excited to talk. Um, I thought I could I could kick off quickly to just talk about a little bit about the game industry, um, and then we can talk about you know the transformations we think might be happening um, uh, as these new economic systems get introduced. Um, yeah, you know, games have been around for about um, 50 years now as a, as an industry, and they started from you know a really niche uh, activity at the beginning to now a truly mass market um, phenomenon that's nearly ubiquitous where almost everyone in the world who has a computing device of any time uh, any kind or an internet connection um, plays games again there's about two and a half million people that, that play games every day now um, it's as we heard in the video um, over 160 billion dollar a year um, revenue industry today and so that's kind of the business side of it but um, to me what's really compelling and cool about games is it is really fun. There are these really rich experiences. They're very immersive. Um, they're ways to connect with people from all over the world uh, and just have you know fun um, playing together. And games are also challenging and you know there's systems where you learn and develop skills and try to overcome um, big challenges. And, and so because they're so interconnected and there's such strong communities in games, um, they just feel like natural, a natural place for um, new economic systems to, to be created and games have gone through different evolutions with business models. And so um, we thought today, you know, we could talk about what might happen as market economies are introduced in games and the economies start to expand. And I thought, Kathy, maybe, you know, you could describe generally, you know, um, what we see when um, new um, economies and more market mechanisms are, are introduced um, into, into systems that, that exist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I thought that it was funny that in the video you used the example of sort of the movement from feudal society to something that's um, starting to look a little bit more more industrial. Um, and so I think, you know, the first thing that I would just point out is that there's a couple um, uh, channels or, or mechanisms by which an economy can grow uh, as a result of sort of introducing um, more property rights or introducing uh, more market type mechanisms. And uh, those two channels are really, um, the one is innovation and um, sort of the creation of, of, of new products um, or investment um, in uh, growing the value of sort of things that already exist in the economy. So um, if you think about, um, uh, like the, um, if you think about property rights as sort of being the difference between, like, say, like renting an apartment versus owning owning a property, usually people who own a property are more likely to put invest, uh, put more value into the, the property that they own. So that's one mechanism, and then the other mechanism is um, by 
creating new allocations uh, in, in the economy. So sort of uh, as we introduce a market, um, we might increase competition uh, for selling goods and services, things like this, um, that might make more goods and services available in the market and make those things more accessible to the demand side, to consumers or players in a game uh, who want to, to access that market. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think both of those have the potential to apply in the context of games and game economies. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point. And that's part of what excites me about, you know, this forthcoming change that, that we see and certainly at Forte that um, we're trying to, to work on is, you know, players today already care about um, the games they play so much. And a lot of times they do invest a great deal of time and money, but also effort and creativity um, into games. And, and um, it's been really interesting to see over the last 20 years or so as games have moved online and these rich communities have been created. It's been, it's been really interesting to see how players um, actually contribute to the games that they play uh, and love. In, in gaming, you know, there's this, there are these things called mods or modifications, um, which are basically player-created additions to an existing game. Um, and the, the mod scene sort of started off small, but now it's a big part of the industry. And some of the top games in the world, like League of Legends or uh, Counter-Strike Go or Defense of the Ancients, were basically player-created um, initially. And so what's really interesting to me to think about is you know, as we simultaneously see players are starting to earn income kind of on the periphery of games through streaming or through esports and essentially being pro players, um, it's interesting to think about, you know, what happens when the ability to earn income and to have property rights um, and to create marketplaces and commerce between players comes into the game. And a way we might see that manifest is, you know, when a, when a player creates a, a, a modification to a game and, and enhances the gameplay, they might be able to uh, earn revenue directly, earn income directly when more players play that modification. And, and maybe the original developer of the game that the mod is based on could take a share of that revenue as well. So exactly in line with what you're saying, I think as, as players have more um, economic agency, as they have more property rights, as, as these systems come to the fore inside of games, I think players will invest even, even more time uh, and even more um, of their creativity uh, into, these, into these games. And hopefully we can create systems that just create more economic opportunity all around. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not going to be simple, you know, to get there. There's a lot of complex challenges to figure out. And, and Kathy, you and Prism Group have done some phenomenal um, work in these areas. And I'm just wondering if you could walk through your perspective on, you know, what sorts of challenges um, an industry faces when it starts to think about, you know, new business models, new economic models, and the introductions of market-based systems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I think the the idea, not not just in terms of a, a specific industry, but in general in national economies of um, driving growth is that sort of when we can get more investment, when we can get more innovation, um, that creates sort of more uh, more value for everyone, more value to go around, and and the rising tide raises all boats. Um, and I, I think that that's, um, that's possible, but it doesn't always happen that way. Right. And so one thing that we really want to look out for is, you know, how is this new value that we're going to create going to be distributed? And is it, is it really going to be the case that everyone benefits or are some folks perhaps going to benefit more than others? And in particular, it's really important to, to think through that issue because if you need to bring on all of these different, uh, different participants, players, developers, in order to, to get to that new uh, way of doing things, then you need to make sure that all of those folks who you need to bring to the table will benefit uh, from, from change. So I think that the biggest challenges I see are um, that it, it's not clear uh, off the bat uh, whether uh, all developers would benefit from this. I think that very much depends on exactly how, um, how these uh, um, changes unfold. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in particular, it could be, for example, that, uh, that newcomer, newcomer developers benefit more than sort of the old guard. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one big issue. 
to, to consider. And then the, the second place where I would look for differences among these different participants is within the category of gamers of people who are playing the game. So you see a lot of difference um, between, um, and I'm sure you could speak and, and give us some more details and, and statistics, um, but you see a lot of difference between sort of people who are um, more dedicated players versus people who are casually playing these games and the introduction of these mechanisms might impact those different groups differently, um, right. which we would directly care about, but it could also impact uh, the feel of the game and, and how gameplay works if, if we're sort of having these differences. Totally right. Yeah, I think you bring up a couple of really important points that, um, that you know, ourselves, I think others in the industry and developers that start to think about these systems really need to bear in mind, which is how do you intentionally design for the sorts of economic, um, the sorts of economies that you want to, that you want to create? Um, and what are the challenges there? And I think, um, you know, you walked through a really interesting example of sort of how might developers embrace this um, type of change. And, you know, what we've seen in the game industry in the past is there have been massive um, revolutions and transformations of the business model uh, of games, the distribution of games, the, the types of games that are popular. And the most recent example of this was the move to, to free to play games. Um, which we talked a little bit about in the video. Um, and in those games, um, a really uh, problematic uh, dynamic occurs. The design challenges we discussed in that, in that video is that you, know, you end up with these free-to-play games that are, that are free to access, but um, only a small percentage of players pay. And so how do you design um, a game where the people who pay sometimes tremendous amounts of, of money you know, aren't just overpowered and don't have um, overwhelming advantage against players that, you know, simply can't pay or, or wouldn't want to. And so it's this really challenging um, incentive structure today with game developers and game players where game developers essentially want to and need to cater to their biggest spenders. Um, and that risks kind of leaving the people that can't pay um, behind. And what's exciting about it, about the possibility of these new systems is that maybe the people who play the game the most but, but can't pay but can't afford to purchase goods in the game, um, can actually start to earn income from these games by being expert or by um, spending time in the game and having other players pay them for their services or for their expertise or purchase the goods that the players have um, have bought from, uh, you know, have have discovered in the game. Uh, and to me, that's really um, exciting to think about. But it gets to the question of, you know, how will developers embrace this, and and really, what do they need to think about when it comes to economic systems and and again you guys have done great work in thinking about things like um, what does ownership of assets really mean what are property rights what what are the claims that an individual might have on a good versus you know the true underlying residual um, control of, of the goods and how can developers start to think about all these trade-offs and so I'd love for you to talk about uh, your view of, of property rights and what those mean what that means in economic terms Absolutely, yeah. So, um, so I sort of alluded a little bit earlier to um, to one aspect of, of owner um, in uh, talking about sort of the difference between renting versus owning something like like a home, um, which I think applies uh, can apply equally well to maybe in game assets. Mm -hmm. um, and and the key here is you know it's it's not just about that you have access to the value of that asset but that you actually control the asset itself, which allows you then to sort of um, capture or um, uh, visions about how to deal with um, modifications or, or investments that you make in that asset. And so it's really those control rights um, that then create the incentive um, to make these kinds of, of investments. And those can be separated from uh, claim rights, which is access to the value of, of the asset. Um, and so um, in, in a game, we, you know, we might have, we design the market or design the assets in a way that allows folks, uh, players to tap into the value of, of the assets that they have in the game or that they're using, um, but not give them control rights. Mm -hmm. or, or on the other hand, we could decide to go that further step and also uh, give them control rights. And, and that might look different. Um, and that might uh, incorporate something like being able to port your asset from one game 
to another. Uh, and so I think that there is different levers that these um, developers are going to have uh, available to them when deciding what these new markets are going to look like. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we start to see the beginnings of this in, in some places in games. And I think it's Im important to understand, too, that, uh, you know, related to your earlier point, it, there's not necessarily a binary sort of cutoff, like where you introduce the idea of property rights to players or, or market economies in a game and just wholesale change every aspect of your game. Um, there are thriving games, you know, today with millions of players that, you know, love them and uh, they have thriving, you know, businesses for the developers that create them too. Um, and one of the things um, we're uh, excited about is seeing developers um, look at ways they can start to introduce property rights and market mechanisms, community economics in an incremental way, even inside existing games. So rather than taking, you know, a game that already, you know, has an audience of players that loves it uh, and is a, a healthy business for the game developers themselves, um, how could they introduce new assets into a game that players um, have more um, property rights with, have more um, claims on the value of, and, and have more control over, uh, and introduce, you know, fun mechanics inside of games um, to do that. Uh, and we're starting to see that happen already today. Um, it's really exciting, and it's also a trend in the, in the industry. We talked a little bit about, you know, players starting to earn income through their play kind of on the periphery of the games industry. Um, but if you look at the few examples of games that introduce um, even the beginnings of marketplace, of market mechanisms uh, into games and the ability for players to, to trade, for example, there's some really compelling examples about how big the economic activity could be, um, how transformative it could be for the industry. So there's a game called Counter-Strike Go, um, which again was started off as a mod of, a, of another game. It started off as a mod of a game called Half-Life. Um, and in Counter-Strike Go, which is the current version of this game, it's a free-to-play game, and players can purchase these skins. They're like cosmetics um, in the game, so you can dress your character in, in different ways. Um, and in Counter-Strike, you can trade um, in players. And, and Counter-Strike, you know, it's been around for a long time. It's been out for over 10 years. It's still a massive game. It's one of the top esports games. Um, but in that game, um, it, it does about, depending on the year, two to $300 million a year in, in direct revenue. Um, so purchases of goods from the players um, to the developer. But in the trading economy, the trading marketplace on top of it, again, depending on the year, there's two to five billion dollars. So an order of magnitude more um, gross merchandise value, essentially gross revenue that flows through the economy as players trade. And so I think it indicates, you know, what's possible when you even start to um, introduce these mechanisms um, inside a game uh, economies and, and even in an incremental way as, as you discussed, Kathy, and, and giving people just a little bit more um, ownership, a little bit more access to value, a little and getting hopefully developers and players a little bit more aligned. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that um, there's a lot to build on uh, in the direction that, that the industry is moving. And mm -hmm. I would love to hear from you sort of what um, where would you like to see this end up? What further innovation do you think uh, is, is the industry in need of right now? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I mean, for me, what's so exciting about the possibility of this space, certainly, you know, what we're working on and what I'm starting to see from developers in the industry is basically tackling this design challenge that we talked about um, in that video, which is really, you know, how do you take the current version of, of gaming, which is wonderful in, in many ways. Again, billions of people play, um, players have a lot of fun, they challenge themselves, you connect with people worldwide, just, the games are just cool, I think. Um, but the big challenge with them is, because they're free to play, like the benefit of that is they're open to access, um, but you know, you have this business model where developers are really dependent on a very small percentage of players that drive almost all the revenue in the game in, in a typical, you know, a, a top free to play game, it's typically less than 1% of the player base drives 80% or more of the total revenue for the game. So you just think about how squarely focused developers have to be on those people that can spend just massive amounts of money um, inside the game. And, you know, a typical player in that top, top percentage of spenders will spend tens of thousands of dollars, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, in the game. So what's exciting to me about working on all this stuff is how can we create systems that have the benefits of free to play where anyone can access the game and you can jump in and have fun. You can connect with people from anywhere in the world, you know, make friends and pull your friends in. Um, just have a great time challenging yourself in a game. 
um, but have a better you know business model where a developer you know could still sell goods to to players and there might be some big spenders you know who who purchase goods directly from the developer but can you create a peer to peer economy can you create um, an economic system where players can help each other and again where you know if I'm a player who maybe just doesn't have I love the game but I don't have a lot of time to play um, and I don't have all the best items or most powerful gear in the game, maybe I could purchase those items from another player or I could pay a player to, you know, guide me through a more challenging, you know, dungeon or, or experience um, in the game. Uh, and that could benefit the player who, you know, maybe can't make um, purchases inside of the game, but now could actually earn income from the game. And so just working on those systems and figuring out, you know, exactly as you said, uh, how to design them so that developers benefit and uh, players benefit as much as possible is what's so exciting to me uh, and part of why you know it's thrilling to work with with you and, and others who have thought so much about you know these economic challenges in, in general and now the opportunity to bring them potentially to, to billions of people around the world is just really cool and I guess what if we think about the situation we were you know we were just recently in and still are in the world where people were you know at home and there was you know hundreds of millions of job losses around the world. You know, if we could wave a magic wand and transform the industry, you know, so that these market systems existed as of a few months ago, you know, people might have been able to, to be at home and play games and engage in these market systems and, and, you know, potentially earned income, you know, from home. So I just think it's such a compelling um, way to think about the future. Yeah, I mean, I think that you... Um paint a really vivid picture of what things could look like. And I think it's really important when, um, when an industry is right for, for disruption and uh, for the folks who are participating in that innovation and that disruption to have sort of a clear idea of what, where they would like to, to be able to get. And in, in economics, we think about layering the design um, that can help us achieve that together with the, um, with that vision um, by, so I use the, uh, we use this uh, concept in, in economics called uh, first best, second best. So the, the first best is that ideal. It's, you know, if I could make sure that, you know, these people are cooperating and this uh, sort of um, innovation is getting developed and this investment is being made, then, you know, we will, we will achieve this, this amazing vision. And the second best is what you can actually achieve given that everyone who's participating is just gonna do whatever it works best for them uh, mm -hmm. in, that, in that system. And you guide, uh, you guide the outcome from where we currently are to the second best by designing good mechanisms that will support that outcome. Um, and so I think, uh, again, it's really important to start with that big vision uh, and then we can sort of come back a little bit and think more precisely about, okay, um, where, where can we practically get from where we are today uh, in the direction of, of where we're trying to go and what, uh, what specific mechanisms, what economic design, because we're building a new market, what economic design do we need in order to, to achieve that uh, achievable outcome? Um, and I yeah. think that um, just, to, just to go back to, um, the, uh, an issue that you brought up earlier, um, you know, there's lots of work that has been done on um, designing these new kinds of marketplaces, designing these new kinds of economies um, in the tech industry uh, in, in the last couple of decades in, within uh, block, the blockchain space over the past few years. That's something that we at Prism Group have been working very hard on. And I think that a lot of the lessons that have been learned uh, in those areas can be ported over to, uh, to uh, games um, in, in order to try to, to make these advancements. Um, and I, you know, we've talked a little bit about um, the, the design of property rights, um, but there are, there are sort of other areas too, market design, incentive design, um, that should certainly be incorporated uh, in this big push. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think, you know, because, um, there's so much to think about it because it can be so complicated. It, as we discussed earlier, I think one of the best ways developers can proceed is to think about you know, small chunks of, of changes that they can make uh, in their game and how they can start to introduce 
you know, again, a, a class of assets that players own and start to get these systems to work and then really learn from players, uh, learn from what they see, um, track um, the metrics and information, and, you know, inside of games, which, which developers are already pretty sophisticated about and, and really start to measure what's happening and try to create more and more benefit for players so that, you know, players stick around in the games longer, um, they have more fun, they, they pull more friends in, uh, and ultimately, you know, hopefully create a bigger um, economy as these sorts of systems introduce. But, um, you know, you really have to think deeply about this stuff. And in some ways that can be intimidating. Uh, so it's, it's also good to realize that there's ways to introduce it incrementally and gradually, even into uh, existing games. Um, yeah, I, I think that's super important. And it also, um, it get so you, you can you can start small with something that's um, that's quickly implementable, um, which is nice. And then it's also very important uh, to have that opportunity to collect data. So you're you're experimenting, you're seeing what works and what the impacts are, and then you can make adjustments before you you roll out something bigger. And that's um, that's really in line with uh, the process of economic design that's used um, in. Uh, in practical microeconomics, um, we've seen that in um, uh, in play in in the tech industry at places like eBay and, and Uber. Um, we've seen it in in um, uh, spectrum auction design, etc. But you really start with um, uh, building on decades of research in in economics and, and economic theory to form some hypotheses uh, to create nice crisp experiments of what you think going to work and then you sort of run these um or, you know incorporate these uh smaller um confined experiments um in a practical setting learn from them and then and then iterate from there and so i think that um that uh that process that that's already being being employed is the right one yeah yeah that's right and, and that's not to say you couldn't just go for it whole hog like some developers i think some game studios will you know, just embrace this and just create new games that are from the ground up designed to, you know, em embrace player economies and community economies. And that'll be really fun to see too. But it's good to know that, you know, even in an existing game, you can start to experiment with this uh, and start to really learn how it works and can benefit your players and, and yourself as a, as a developer. Um, and, you know, it's an important issue in the game industry because we already see players um, engaging in secondary markets and even, you know, gray markets and trading with each other uh, outside of games of almost every major successful um, game essentially has an, an economy, a, you know, a peer-to-peer -peer economy, a player-to-player -player economy kind of around the game. It's just not embraced because of, you know, it's so complex to figure out these issues. And it's one of the things that blockchain can really help solve for game developers is the security around the ownership of these assets and the transactions um, that need to take, to take place with developers. Um, as developers think about these incentive systems, you know, how can they enshrine them, you know, in a way that players can understand them and, and trust that, you know, the incentives really are, you know, what the developer claims that they are. And that's again, where blockchains and smart contracts can help. Uh, and I think, you know, um, Kathy, as we close out in the last um, couple of minutes here, I just want to thank you again for, for joining and, you know, if you have any parting thoughts about the types of economic systems that developers should think about, um, I think it will help point um, game developers to um, the sorts of things they, they should start to research and uh, potentially work with, you know, folks like you and, and Prism on. Absolutely. So I think that the last point you made is, is actually a super important one. And we have seen throughout history that uh, markets do arise spontaneously. Um, so things, things like black or gray markets um, will pop up just because people want to participate in them. Um, but markets don't function very well, very efficiently, accidentally, right? right? It takes a design to make them work well for the people who are participating in them. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important that, um, that an effort is made uh, to make these markets function well and to employ economic design market design, information systems, um, incentives in order to ensure that those challenges of uh, rising all boats uh, can be met and that, uh, that this vision of the future can actually be achieved. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, Kathy, for, for talking to Gay today. It was, it was, it was great to, uh, to discuss all this. Uh, and thank you again, everyone, for attending. There, there's a, a Q&A um, session, so if you have questions, um, please fire away, and, and Kathy and I will um, try to answer them. Thanks, everyone.